I now look to Sir Vince Cable to continue the case for the proposition. Mr. President, can I thank you very warmly for your invitation and uh, it's a great privilege to follow four really excellent, eloquent speeches and I'd particularly like to commend Victoria, I think a much classier act than the gentleman who was sh she's standing in for, who I believe is Dr. Liam Fox, is that right? Um, trade Minister who was uh, effectively unemployed, so we got the wrong out, I'm sorry. But uh, it's, it's a particular pleasure to speak opposite um, Damien Green, who is in effect, if not in name, the, the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, there is a precedent for his role as an as a absolutely loyal and dependable deputy. Um, in the era of Mrs Thatcher, she, she had a deputy called William Whitelaw, uh, which led to the famous line that, that every Prime Minister needs a willy. And, uh, <laughs> The, the line that every Prime Minister needs a Damien, I said, let's have a ring about it, but uh, I think it's, uh, it makes the same point, that he's been uh, a commendably loyal supporter of the Prime Minister in her hour of need. Uh, my perspective on all this is a bit different from my three Labour colleagues on this side, because uh, I was in government with the Conservatives for five years. Uh, we, my party, took the view that it was in the national interest that we should form a coalition uh, at a time of economic <coughs> emergency. So my proposition here is the contrast between five years of coalition government and the two and a bit years we've had under undiluted conservative government. And it is a very striking contrast <laughs> because although there were many things that um, were controversial in what we did in the coalition, uh, undoubtedly we had, to coin a phrase, strong and stable government. And what we've had since is weak and wobbly government. We've had one Prime Minister gone, another one who is held in open disrespect and sometimes outright contempt by her own colleagues. We've had a uh, government that in the coalition years was backed at the outset by two-thirds of the electorate. We've now got a minority government propped up by a sectarian party from Northern Ireland on the basis of a bribe. Under the coalition government, we sought to turn around an economy that had been shattered by the banking crisis and the fiscal problems that arose from it. And at the end of it, we had the most rapidly growing economy in the developed world amongst the G7. And in the two and a half years that have followed, the British economy has gone from the top of the G7 countries in economic performance to the bottom. Now, the question I want to ask is the question Hilary Benn posed very well, which is, you know, what actually is the Conservative government for? What is it trying to do, apart from keeping Jeremy Corbyn out of power? What are its objectives? Now, I, I was always under the impression that the Conservatives were about free markets and competition. But only today, they introduced price controls, energy cap for energy, <laughs> which, until recently, they denounced as socialist economic illiteracy, when it was proposed by the then leader of the Labour Party. They claim to be uh, a party of free trade. They are currently in the process of disengaging Britain from the largest and most successful tree trading organisation in the world. They have long traded on a reputation, or at least a belief, in economic competence, and within the last few months, we've seen a massive U-turn on the biggest proposal in the budget and another U-turn on the big, complex financial issues around long-term personal care. But the best example, and in a way the most telling example, of how incompetence has combined with inhumanity is the way in which they're managing welfare reform. When I was in the coalition, we 
Conservative ministers, but with our support, came up with the idea of universal credit. And the concept was a sensible one. It was how do you combine six benefits into one? How do you make it attractive for people to work? The principles were fine. But what has now happened is the most extraordinary degree of administrative incompetence. Yep. We have tens of thousands of very poor people <laughs> who have no income for weeks or months on end because the system cannot deliver it. They are offered telephone helplines that never answer. They have an appeal system that never, never gets together. And the worst of all, is that once they'd got the Liberal Democrats out of the government, they took four billion pounds out of something called a work allowance. And the practical effects of this is that if you are a single earner but two-parent family with a couple of kids living in a council house, they've taken off a hundred pounds a week from your income, not a month, a week. And even worse, there is something that's been introduced called a child allowance within, or a child element within, the, um, within this new universal credit system. And the way it works is that if you have two children, you get an allowance. If you have three or four, you get nothing for the extra children unless you happen to be a woman who can prove that you have been raped. This is the system that now operates. A, a, a lethal combination of extreme incompetence and complete lack of sensitivity and humanity. But the biggest issue of all, and the two speakers on our side have made this point, I think, with great eloquence, is the appallingly incompetent way in which the Brexit negotiations have been handled. We're not here to re-debate the referendum. I think as it happens, all of the speakers here, maybe not Victoria, but all of them are Remainers, or were. I think we probably all believe that we'd be better off inside the European Union than out of it. But that's not actually the practical issue. The practical issue is how they are negotiating the deal for the country. And what has happened is that we've got a government that is dysfunctional, it's disorganised, it's disunited, the fundamental differences between different members of the cabinet are not only sending a demoralizing message to the British public, they're sending absolutely confusing signals to the European Union negotiators who have the faintest idea who they're negotiating with, who have no idea if any concessions that they ever make will ever be accepted in the UK. We, they embarked upon the Article 50 uh, process uh, having not begun to thought through the complexities of the problem, uh, we're now almost halfway through the negotiations and haven't yet reached the first stage of talking about the trade relationships, which are absolutely fundamental to the living standards of hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of people in this country. It is an extraordinary state of affairs. Now, of course, there is a way out. My party's offering it which is to say that if you really trust the people, if we are talking here about the will of the people, you go back to the people at the end of the negotiations and you say to them, I'm just finishing, so let me just conclude this section. At the end of the negotiations, when you know what is in store, what they have negotiated or not, whether it's crashing out or some orderly deal, and you put it to the public, do you want to go ahead with what's been negotiated or do you have an exit from Brexit? Giving people that choice. Now, I suspect that privately there are a lot of members of the government who would desperately <laughs> like a way out of that kind. But we know they're not going to do it and they know that the reason they're not going to do it is because they will be torn limb from limb by the ideologues in their own party. And that, in essence, in essence, is the problem we have tonight. That we have a government that is not being run in the interests of the country, it's been run in the interests of their party. And it's a party that is riddled with vanities and ambitions and fundamental ideological divisions that is causing very great harm. 
So I urge you to support this proposition and not to have confidence in the government. Thank you.